So Jude, starting at verse 20. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Now unto him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray as we come to think about how this passage applies to us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us and prepares us to live the life that you have called us to live. And we ask that you give us ears to hear, the hearts to understand, and the will to put into practice what you are teaching us through your servant Jude today. Amen. So has anyone here ever been in a fight? Because that's what Jude's Jude's all talking about, fighting for the faith. If you've ever learned a martial art of any sort, you'll know that learning how to fight is hard work. It takes lots of preparation, repetition, and discipline to learn all the skills that you need in order to defend yourself. If you just run into a fight swinging wildly, you're going to lose. And so when Jude tells us to fight for the faith, the next obvious question is, well, how do we do that, Jude? How do we train? What are we supposed to do? Well, hopefully, Jude didn't stop his letter at verse 19. He continued on to verse 20. And he tells us exactly what we should do. So last week, we remember, Jude warned his readers of the judgment that is coming. He warned us there are false teachers in the church, and we need to be ready to counter them, to fight for the faith because God is preparing to punish all those who lead others astray from his word. So, to protect yourself, Jude tells us to do one thing, and it's in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's it. That's all you need to do. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Thanks, Jude. Between that and Steve's great kids talk, I think we're done here. I can sit down, right? Well, no, because we need to know, what does that mean, Jude? What does it mean to keep yourself in the love of God? What does it look like? Well, helpfully, Jude goes on and he tells us, it looks like building and praying and waiting expectantly for the mercy and the coming of Christ. By building, Jude is talking about growing in our faith, and the best way to do that is by spending time in God's word reading what God has to say to us, growing and listening to him day in and day out. We build ourselves up in the faith by spending time with God in his word. It's really that simple because the more time we spend in God's word, the better we are able to see the great gap between what the false teachers claims and what God himself tells us. The more we know who God is and what he's like, the more readily we'll be able to discern, hang on, What that person said isn't right because God already tells us in his word the opposite. So Jude wants us to spend time in God's word, remembering who God is and what he's done for us. He tells us to pray, but particularly he wants us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Now this is not a special kind of magical prayer that that Jude wants us to pray. Every prayer we pray is in the Holy Spirit. And that's because it's the Holy Spirit who actually enables us to pray in the first place. The death and resurrection of Jesus makes us worthy to come before a holy God. That's why all the prayers in the prayer book end with, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But unfortunately, God is so different to us, so transcendent, that we as mere creatures couldn't possibly hope to talk to him. 
It'd be like an ant coming up to you while you're gardening and trying to talk to you and telling you where the best place to plant your peas are. It doesn't work. But in God's great mercy, he has given us the gift of his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and allows us as creatures to come before the creator of the universe, the transcendent God himself, and speak to him, coming before him with our prayers, thanksgiving, and praise. So every prayer we pray is in the Holy Spirit. So Jude just wants us to pray, to get to know God, to spend time with him, learning from him in his word, and communicating with him in prayer. Both these two things grow us in our dependence on him, grow us in our love of God, help us to know who he is, what he has done, and prepare us to fight against the false teachers that we're going to encounter. And finally, Jude wants us to wait expectantly for the mercy of Christ. Jude tells us that we are to fully expect mercy when Christ comes again. The false teachers can expect nothing but punishment, but we can expect mercy. And Jude's not telling us to do all these things in order to save ourselves. Do you remember what he said last week in verse 1? When he's writing to his readers, he addresses them like this, to those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept in Christ Jesus. We are called, and so we can fully expect the mercy of God when Jesus returns on the last day. We are loved, and so we can confidently pray to God the Father, knowing that he will hear and answer us. We are kept by Christ Jesus, so we know that we can keep ourselves and build ourselves up in the faith because he's already got his hand on us. He's already protecting us. He's already looking after us. So what Jude is asking us to do is to not earn our salvation or somehow magically make ourselves super Christians. He's asking us to be who we already are. The more we remember who we are and what God has done for us, the better able we'll be able to defend against the attacks and the lies of the devil and the false teachers. Far too often when we fall into sin and start listening to false teachers, it's because we've forgotten who we are. We've started loving something more than we love God. And so Jude says, remember who you are. Keep yourself in the faith by building, waiting, and praying. And where, when are the times that we do the most building, waiting, and praying? Here, at church, Bible studies during the week. That's what the whole church service is about. We read God's word to build ourselves up in the faith. We pray in the Holy Spirit, and we encourage each other to wait expectantly for the mercy that we can fully expect when Jesus Christ returns. So an easy way to prepare yourself for the fight, to train and to spar, is to come to church, be regular at Bible study, read the word and pray with your family during the week. Church, Bible study, well, they're the martial arts dojos of the spiritual battle that we're facing. This is where we get our training. This is where we prepare ourselves. What about other people? I myself may not be facing a fight against false teachers. How can I help other people who might be? Well, Jude tells us exactly what we can do to help the people next to us in their fight against false teachers as well. Have a look at verse 23. Have mercy on the people who doubt, or in your pew Bibles, have mercy on those who waver. Snatch others from the fire. Have mercy on others hating the flesh-stained garments. So who are all these people? How are we to treat them? Well, the first group is pretty obvious. Those who waver or doubt. All the people who read the Bible and have questions, who wonder, is this really what God says? 
Am I really saved? And the answer to them is to have mercy, to be gentle with them, bring them back to the Bible and remind them of exactly who God is and what he has done for them. People with questions are not to be rebuked, not to be shunned into silence. They are to be shown mercy and graciously pointed back to the God who has saved them. The Bible is big enough to handle your questions. God is powerful enough to deal with your doubts. And more often than not, doubts can be helpful. Doubts force you to ask questions, and as you ask questions, you find answers. And as you find answers, your faith will grow. That's certainly how it's been in my life. The more questions that I've asked of the Bible, the more answers God has shown me, and the more I've been able to say, wow, isn't God amazing? As you can tell, I'm a bit of a talker, and so I would pester my parents nonstop with questions. My favorite was to endlessly ask, why? 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 Why, Dad? Why? Eventually, they got sick of it. But God, our Father, is not like our human parents. He has endless patience. He can deal with it when we come to him and say, Why, God, why? Why, why, why? And so we as a church are to have patience, show mercy on those who doubt. If you have questions, ask them, please. That's the only way you'll find an answer. And if someone asks you, Have mercy. Bring them back to the Bible and remind them of who they are and what God has done for them. The next group of people who need to be snatched from the fire are the people who have started wandering away from the church and are in danger of falling into the snare of the false teachers. These people still need to be shown mercy, but more drastic action might need to be taken to drag them away and bring them back into God's people. So if I come to your house for a meal and I see a copy of the Pearl of Great Price and the Watchtower sitting on your coffee table, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that those publications end up in the bin where they belong because they are dangerous texts that teach lies about God. Both the Mormons and the J-dubs will claim to be Christian, all at the same time denying the lordship of Christ. And so we need to be very careful with them. And so when I see their publications on your table, if I hear that you've been reading them more than you've been reading the Bible, drastic action will need to be taken. I will pull you out of that fire. That's my job. But as we pull each other out of the fire, we need to remember, fires are hot. Don't get burnt yourself in the process of helping your friends come back to God's people. And then finally, Jude mentions those who we are to have mercy on but hate the flesh-stained garments that they wear. What on earth is he going on about? Well, these are the people who have come out of a church that teaches lies and false teachings. For some of them, the teachings may be so ingrained in their history that they will need to get rid of everything that reminds them of that. Just like you wouldn't take an ex-alcoholic to dinner at a pub for fear of their relapse, if someone has come out of a church that teaches false doctrines, You're not going to encourage them to read things written by that pastor. You're not going to encourage them to go back on a Sunday to see if anything's changed. No, for some of us, we will need to get rid of everything in our past because it's likely to drag us back into false ways of living and to cause us to forget who we are. This is how we help each other. We can fight for one another when other people are fighting the fight for their faith. We can have mercy on them when they have questions. We can pull them from the fire if necessary, and we can help them avoid all the things from their past that remind them of the false teachings that they once believed. 
But not only are we fighting for ourselves, we are fighting for each other, which is again why we need to be coming to church and to Bible study. There are thousands of great preachers who you can find on the internet. Their sermons are better than mine. Their insights greater. But they can't fight for you in the same way that the people in the pews next to you can. Tim Keller is a great preacher, but he won't hear the questions you have when you start doubting your salvation. John MacArthur doesn't know that you're wandering away from the church and need to be snatched from the fire. John Piper won't know that there are flesh-stained garments that you need to be rid of in your life. And so this is why we come to church, because the people you sit next to week in, week out here at church and at Bible study, they're the people who will hear your questions. They will be the ones who have mercy in your doubts, who can snatch you from the fire. God has called us into his people to gather because we can help each other. It is here that we build and we pray and we wait, and it's here that we can fight for each other as we all face our own battles during the week. And finally, Jude reaches our memory verse where he reminds us that it's not just us fighting. God is fighting for us because by ourselves we're not able to do anything. We're not able to fight for ourselves. We don't have the power. We constantly forget who we are and what God has done for us. But did you see how Jude describes God in verse 20? Now unto him who is able to protect you from stumbling. God is fighting for you too. God is standing next to you fighting for you. This is why our praying and our building and our waiting are effective. It's not because we work hard at them, but because God is working through them to fight for us. He is the one making sure that we will not fall. We are kept by him and he will not lose us, no matter what happens in our lives. And not only is he able to protect us from stumbling, Christ will then stand with us and present us before his glorious presence with great joy. He won't look at us exasperated and say, oh, yep, I finally dragged this one over the line. No, it is with great joy that he will say, here is my brother or sister. Here they are, Father. They're with me. In this way, Jesus acts like a good older brother to his little sibling. An older brother, when they're walking with their sibling, will helpfully point out all the potholes in the road, hold their hand, help them avoid the traps. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. Walks with us, says, watch out, there's a hole there, don't fall in that. And then when he comes again, we can fully expect his mercy because he has kept us. So why do we fight for the faith? How do we do it? We remember who we are, what God has done for us. We build, we pray, we wait expectantly because we are called, we are kept, and we are loved. So we prepare ourselves by, for the fight by keeping ourselves in God's love. We meet together so that we can fight for each other and protect ourselves. We continue to meet together as God's people to train, to build ourselves up, to read his word, and we trust that he can do what we cannot. We remember that we do not stand in this fight alone because God himself is standing with us, and he is able to prevent us from stumbling and enable us to stand. We keep ourselves. We fight the fight for the faith because Christ has already won the war 
and he is the one who is fighting for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son and we thank you for the church that you have called us into. Give us the strength we need to fight for the faith that you have given us and give us the assurance that you have kept us and will protect us from stumbling. Amen.